All right, tonight, medical overview. So we're gonna go over a few things and um, this is just kind to try to wrap everything together, trying to get some of the, the ins and outs of the medical. Um, there is the different topics in here as we go, my computer ain't wanted to work, um, as we go over some things. So we'll, we'll make sure all the core stuff is answered and, and going over, but there's a few things we talk about in here that I'd like to try to address a little bit further. Um, as we know, here's the same fundamentals and the standard competencies that we always have to talk about. The fundamental knowledge to provide basic emergency care and transportation based on assessment findings for an acute ill patient. Uh, we're going to go over the assessment and management of medical complaints, pathophysiology assessment and management of medical complaints to include transport mode. And we're going to try to help you understand why you transport in this mode versus that mode and what decisions are made. And then your destination decision. Why are we choosing? Oh, I'll, I'll wait. Let's wait. I don't want to go off in there. Oh, I don't know if y'all not ever heard about this, but we're going to talk about infectious disease. Um, it's awareness of patients who have an infectious disease and assessment and management patients who may have an infectious disease. We live in that time. I think we're all kind of experts on this decision right now of infectious diseases. So but we're still going to go into it. We're going to dive off into there. So part of your introductions, patients who need EMS assistance generally have experienced a medical emergency, trauma emergency, or both. Trauma emergencies, oh, hold on, got confused here, involve injuries resulting from physical forces applied to the body. Medical emergencies involve illnesses or conditions caused by disease. It is important to remember that all patients have a combination of medical and trauma conditions. Each call you go to may, may be classified in a, an emergency call, I mean, a, uh, a, a trauma or a uh, medical. So, and the way that we figure out how to diverse these apart is we need to know what our baseline is. Do GCSs will give you a good thing. That's the Glasgow comma scale. Even a person that's dead gets a three and the best one around gets a 15. So depending upon where this person rates on your GCS scale, it could be a, a high priority medical patient. Um, I will tell y'all just so you know, it's less than eight. You always intubate. Now, granted, you I don't expect none of y'all to ever try to drop a tube because that's completely 100% out of your scope of practice. And I don't want to see anybody get in trouble for that. But you know, if you get as a basic truck respond somewhere and you get this patient and they just look like a bag of bones and they don't look good and you start doing your full medical assessment and you're like, I think their GCS is like, you know, borderline non a they, they just not good. You know, you need to jump on that because if you don't jump on that in the beginning, it's going to bite you in the butt. And then you're going to have no fun the rest of the time on the way to the hospital because it's going to be so rough. Um, <laughs> all right, types of a medical emergency. So we're going to talk about respiratory emergencies occur when the patient is having trouble breathing or when the amount of oxygen supplied to the tissues is inadequate. So let's talk about that. At some point in time, we've all had some respiratory, some shortness of breath. Uh, we've had some type of respiratory illness. You may have had uh, pneumonia. You may have had uh, asthma as a child. You may have asthma now, but we've all been there. I'm going to tell you, I'm a big old boy, and you start putting me on stairs or you know, in this heat, it, it sucks. I, I mean, it sucks bad. But that being known is we all try to handle it there. But people that already live with this day in, day out. So when their body drops below a certain given number, each person is different. But on a normal adult, we want you to hang in around, you know, the 96, 97, 98 range. You go lower than that, we need to try to, you know, supply some supplemental oxygen. So cool. So we, we kind of know, and those are tools in the tool bag that we're using of what we use on a truck. So if you've got a pulse ox, let's use it. Um, those are tools that we can make easily jump on. So the cardiovascular emergencies caused by conditions affecting the circulatory system. 
Okay, we're, we're going to dive into that a little bit more. Some uh, neurologic emergencies involve the brain. You may have a, uh, sorry, I was trying to answer my wife and get that right. So if you have a stroke, okay, so we know those are blood clots that are affecting the brain. And we know that those, that's when the brain starts getting affected, you start having more of a drive for other issues to start to be affected. Um, so your gastro conditions, appendix, diverticulitis, pancreas, uh, pancreatitis, and many others. So let's not forget this wonderful disease or this wonderful aggravating uh, URI or complete body of COVID. So COVID affects all of these areas. As we're talking about the respiratory, cardio, the neurological and the gastro conditions, it affects them all in different ways. Um, majority of the people that get this go into a respiratory issue and then they go to uh, have pneumonia. That's what puts them on the ventilator. Um, you have all of these different effects. You're going to, you, um, I know when I had it that you, I had the upset stomach. I had the, uh, you know, like, wow, like my stomach's swollen. What is this? Like, you feel like you ate something that just made you swell. So you have all these, that's the reason why when you go to the doctor, you're like, have they answer like 500 questions and you're like, no, no, no. Well, you know, I jokingly say you can't have the normal flu these days. That's against the rules. So, but just pay into plays, even though when you're interviewing somebody or doing your initial assessment, when somebody starts saying that they have had, you know, nausea, vomiting and, you know, upset stomach for the last two days. Well, you automatically got to start thinking COVID. I know there's no other disease or no other functions out there right now besides COVID. But start thinking about that too. Um, I'm pretty sure most of you guys are pretty smart and educated enough to where y'all read a lot about what's going on with this COVID. So just, just know these signs and symptoms and helps you build the basis. So urologic emergencies, the kidney stones, very, very painful. Uh, endocrine emergencies, most commonly caused by complications of diabetes. And uh, hematologic emergencies may result in sickle cell disease or various types of blood clotting disorders, such as hemophilia. Now, I, I've taken care of several people with sickle cell. I, I just know that they complain of complete full body aches. It hurts to pick them up. It hurts to move them. It hurts to put them on the stretcher. Everything hurts. It, it is like crystals without their inside their entire body that's poking them at any point in time. It's kind of the same description that I've heard people describe, describe gout, but this goes into the entire body. So when people tell you they have sickle cell and they're having a sickle cell crisis, be gentle, be very courteous, be very gentle, be just the utmost because they don't. They don't have a choice. They, they, it sucks because they can't really do a whole lot. And they just get thrown into the mass people at the hospital. That They got to sit and wait. And that's bad because that crisis, it's, it is treatable. It is not something that you're going to get. Okay, here's an injection. See you later. No, it's not that. It takes a little bit of time. Before I get round off into another, uh, going down a rabbit hole, I'm gonna make sure I clean the neck. So, so immunological emergencies involve the body's response to foreign substances. Toxicology includes poisonous substance abuse. So what have we gone over that we can use for a toxic, toxicologic emergency? What can we use? There's two things that I'm trying to look for. That what can we use as EMT basis? Can somebody tell me? All right, Caesar's on point with a Narcan. What's next? Anybody else? I'm looking for one other one. Has to do with poisoning. Activated charcoal. Appreciate Caesar. You're on point. So everybody reads what he put. So we know we have Narcan because that is a poisoning or a drug that can help reverse that. And then any other type of poisoning that you can use activated charcoal. Now, like I've told you before, when it's time for activated charcoal, be prepared because that crap's going everywhere. If, you, if you're sweating on your forehead and it's kind <clears> of, <throat> and the patient does that, 
you, you char your head's gonna have charcoal on it. So fair warning. And then when they throw up, it's it's err aware. All right. Some medical emergencies are caused by physiological or behavioral uh, problems, and gynecology emergencies involve female reproductive organs. Bro, that is one chapter I've told Rob multiple times that I just despise teaching gynecology. And it's not that uh, just because it's one of those, it's a, I know enough about it, but it's like, I know enough to get me in trouble. I've sat through some other classes and, you know, gynecology emergencies throughout some different other presenters, but it's just one of those, like, I just hate teaching it. So when we get to that, I'm going to do my dang just to find y'all a, uh, uh, a, a guest speaker that night. All right, so let's hear. So types of emergencies. So look at your table on 15-1. This talks about different types of emergency that you're going to see and some of the related conditions. Now, can one of these be in multiple categories? Yes, they can. So just because, let's look at this sheet. You're having a, uh, a substance abuse, food plant, or chemical poisoning. So just because we know that's a poisoning, as in to the body. So let's think about that. So if we're just going to use food. So let's say I've exposed you to peanuts. Well, not only is it a toxologic, toxologic poisoning, now we have a respiratory. We're going to start to have a, uh, where's the other one? Depending on how bad it is, they may go into a cardiovascular emergency because so these can dab into several different areas. And not just because they're hanging out, just because I have an appendix, appendicitis doesn't mean it's just going to be gastro. It can be other areas. It can mask itself. Um, it's, it's one of those like, okay, if I go to a cardiac call and the guy's, you know, complaining, he's short of breath, does have all the signs and symptoms but he's continuously to sweat. Well, what that tells me is that it may be related to something else because when you go into a, a, cardio, cardio, a cardiologic emergency, a lot of the times the sweat beads on the forehead just don't run. They just sit there like millions of little bitty beads that's on the forehead. I can't tell you why. Now, I'm not going to say that that is every single time or that's what you're going to see all the time. I can't tell you. I can't tell you that, but those are some of your little telltale signs that helps you build your uh, background, helps you build a patient assessment. And you can be like, okay, well, maybe he is going to cardiac. So what if I check his, you know, his blood pressure, his pulse rate? Because obviously we can't put him on three leads, but we can build a basis of what we, what we know and start doing the best treatment for this patient. You know, I've told y'all multiple, multiple times, oxygen is cheap. And it's, it's very accessible because it's on your truck. You have the big uh, D cylinders and then you have the little bitty cylinders that are in your jump bag or you may have an airway bag. They're always there. So just, just get it. Don't withhold it somebody because just that little bit gets, helps them catch their breath. Yeah, kind of relaxes them a little bit. So just take it the way it is. Give them some oxygen, some low dose, a nasal cannula, maybe three, four liters. And that may help you in the long run to try to diagnose your patient as you, as you go forward. Little tools like that. Um, patient assessment. So when I look at my patient, I'm starting to figure out what's going on. What do they look like? Are they breathing? And as I'm walking up to them, I'm like, hey, Mr. Fred, hey, or hey, Mr. Fred, how you doing? This is Chris Wallace in the ambulance service. Can I come over there and help you? Yes, I know. They called 911 for you to help Fred, but you got to ask. It's that day and time to where you may not have, you may have touched them and they didn't want you to, but make those statements. If Fred looks at me and says, yeah, that's what I called for. I need some help. It's bad as you want to pull out that smart aleck card and be like, well, you know, let me tell you, you're going to be like, okay, so tell me what's going on today. If you have bystanders there trying to tell you what his nature is, just be like, thank you so much. Now I'm going to try to get Mr. Fred to answer me because Maybe what you see is a little different than what Fred's uh, having, but thank you for the information. Because you don't want to cut them off because well, you might need their assistance in a few minutes to help move Fred, and you were just a butthole to them, and they're going to remember that. All right, so what symptoms? So I want to know, even if Fred says, my right toe hurts, 
but you notice his left arm is missing and he's squirting blood. On your report, I'm the guy who's going to tell you what his chief complaint was, was his big toe hurt. But his symptoms are, my toe hurts. Oh, oh, okay. Well, I don't know if that's a symptom, but all right, pain. I mean, pain to left big toe. Even though his chief complaint is just big toe pain. And I have found that during my assessment, he's missing an arm. Now, don't write that if he has prosthetics. You know, that could make you kind of look bad in the long run. But if they stay, you know, Mr. Fred, what's going on today? What would you call me for today? I'm having trouble breathing. Well, if the family member looks at him, he's like, he's always having trouble breathing. I don't know what he called for today. Mr. Fred, so what is different right now than was different four hours ago? What made you call right now? Okay, so then you go with that. So obviously something has changed in his overall symptoms, the way he feels to be like, you know what? If I don't call, something's gonna happen and that's why he called because that's important to him. So build your assessment off of what they're telling you and what you see. The only thing you can do is start with what you can see. All right, so push the button, Chris. All right, so establish an adequate, accurate medical history. Now, this may be something too that you can ask family. If you'd be like, hey, Mr. Fred, do you have hyperglycemia? And they look at you and like, what the hell did you just say to me? Do you have high sugar or low sugar? Just because you know the terms, don't mean you got to say them. You, it's okay to say you got high sugar or low sugar. Most people will pick up on that. You're not talking down to them. You're just breaking things down to their level. All right. So you want to build the best accurate history that you can. Now, when they turn around at the same time and, and say, well, here's his bag of medicine. And you're like, holy crap, that's two Walmart bags. Nobody, I don't know every single drug that's out there. I don't know who does. But guess what? I got a Googler on my phone and I'm going to Google what they are. Write them down. Most new reports can only take so many. But at the same time, as you need to make sure that you list a good bit of their medications because you are also building a chart with that patient in your system. So use dispatch information to guide initial response. So my wife is an old dispatcher. I call her my dispatcher. I have done it for years, but I'm going to tell you, they can only tell you what they're told. They don't have no drone. They don't have no camera. They can't see what's going on. If they tell you you're responding to shortness of breath and you get there and the dude's got a 12 gauge hole in his chest, guess what? That's all that somebody called him 911 and told him is that they're having trouble breathing. They didn't say why. They didn't say, well, he's having trouble breathing because he got shot. So it's not dispatch's fault. As much as we want to blame them and say, well, they could have asked more questions. They have a system. It's called emergency medical dispatcher that trains them as in a chart. They have flip code, uh, flip charts. If, if they medically dispatch the call, they may just be a police department and then turn around and roll the call over to the ambulance service and they stay on the line to get information. That's okay, but somebody within the group does medically dispatch the call. So if the fire department gets there and be like, we were coming short as breath, the ambulance gets there and says, oh, we were told we were coming to, you know, a shooting. Well, because the dispatcher didn't stay on the phone long enough. Maybe they have four other calls coming in. That, that's okay. I tell you that because being married to a dispatcher, I, hype on, I harp on that is don't blame them. But the more education you can do with your dispatchers, the better off it is. Encourage your agency to allow dispatchers to do ride time. Encourage your agency to allow you to go sit into dispatch to get both sides of the story. See what goes on. Yes, we know our dispatchers get off on time, no matter what, every single time. They don't get wet. They always eat. It, it sucks, but it's the line of work we chose. Don't get locked in just into a preconceived idea of the patient's condition. Just because you got tunnel vision, uh, you're focusing on what you see. You're like, oh, my God, he's missing an arm. Holy cow, there's blood squirting out of it. That's easy to fix. 
But what you don't see is that blood that's pooling inside his abdomen because of the, uh, he broke his pelvic because you've just focused in on just what you see. A tunnel vision will kick you in the teeth. Doing a very, very good patient assessment is going to help you out uh, both sides, you know, pre and post uh, transport. Because when you get to the hospital, they'll be like, bro, let me tell you, that dude you brought in earlier, he did have a bleed in the stomach. I'm glad you brought that up. Well, you can note that because you have your initial blood pressure, your transportation blood pressure, your transport blood pressure, your you're going to be checking this every five minutes because it's a critical patient. You can build that trend as you go throughout your patient care. So just because you're like, oh, God, he's got, he's squirting, he's squirting, he's, his arm. Okay, so what? Put a tourniquet on it, high and tight, keep moving on. I, that's all I can tell you to do because there's other issues that are going on. And it may be his leg. He he may not even have anything missing, but just because you're like, oh, God, it's Fred again. What's wrong now? Well, maybe Fred's not acting the same because he slipped, tripped, and fell and knocked the hell up out of his head when he fell. And now he's having a, a traumatic brain injury that you are failing to miss because you're like, oh, it's Fred. Imagine that. What's going on? We all and every service that you go to, there is a Fred. There's a frequent flyer. There's there's that guy or gal that everybody knows. But don't just say, oh, well, I know what's going on this time. Go ahead and get in the bag, Fred. I have done that. I have gotten, I've burnt myself. I give them all, even if I see them three and four times a night, hey, buddy, good to see you again. I've missed you. It's been an hour. What's up? Go from there. Move, keep building your story. Keep building your your pictures of what that patient's painting you. And it may just be that they're begging for attention because they are suicidal or homicidal. Uh, so, and that, sorry, that's SI and HI, suicidal and homicidal ideation that builds those. And, and you may be the one to catch it. You may have to transport him, be like, you know what? Let me transport him to the east side because they don't see him a lot and they'll actually try to fix what's going on. So just because you see this, don't, don't get locked in because something else may be going on that you are missing. So build your patient assessment a little, 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 little. Build your patient assessment on your interventions uh, as your assessments as you're going and build it off a good thing. Assessment may be difficult with uncooperative or hostile patients. Okay. Never, ever put yourself in a situation that is going, just try it. Sorry. Huh? Oh, sorry. I'm trying to talk to my kid, trying to eat something new, and he, he's not. Um, so never put yourself in a position to where it's going to allow you to get yourself hurt. If you put yourself and stay in a situation, who is going to come help you? Because now you were just retarded enough to stay there and you got yourself hurt. I can talk to Fred. I've seen him so much. No, Fred's having some issues. Let somebody else just got more friends and, and bracelets to come help him. And I do mean the metal bracelets, not just the, the fluffy ones. Let them come do that. But never let your, your fear show. It's okay to be like, oh, my God, it's because you got startled. But they're going to build off of that. Don't always stay professional. I, I'm in the mindset and I have done this no matter where I've been. I will be as professional with anybody as I can. But when they cuss me, sir, I appreciate that. If you, if you want to continue to cuss me, I'm going to end this right now and we're going to leave. I'm here to help you. But if you want to continue to talk like that, sir, I understand you're telling me to go to hell. And I, I hear that's a hot place. But if you keep this talk up, let, I'm going to leave and we're, we're not going to be here to help you. That is a hostile environment that you need to try to withdraw yourself and protect yourself. Refrain from labeling patients. We just went over that. We talked about how not to just build that, oh, God, it's Fred. Because you're going to get to those and you're going to get to the frequent callers. And then you're going to pull up and there's going to be like, there's Linda and her 18 bags of stuff to go to the hospital. Linda, you can't take but one. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all have all done it from the fire service to 
you know, your, your volunteers, once you get on these ambulances and start doing your rides, you're going to meet the Freds and the Lindas. You're, you're going to come across them because the crews are going to be like, oh, I'm so glad you're here. You can deal with Fred now. I don't have to talk to him. I, I don't know what else to tell you, but that's it. But don't build your impressions off of there because it, it can turn around and bite you. And then the, that person's going to take that and be like, wow, you know, they actually listened to me this time. What's wrong with them? <laughs> Maybe hit you. No. All right. So seam size up. The very first thing you start building a seam stop is seam size up is off your dispatch. If that dispatcher tells you you're going to a MVC rollover with ejection, in your head you should be thinking, "Oh God, I don't, I don't know what to do. This is the first time I've ever responded to one." But do I need additional resources? Am I going to need air on standby? Where's my closest trauma center? Um, do I have, do I need ALS en route if you're just a basic truck? Or even if you're an advanced truck, ask your partner, hey, do you mean go ahead and get another unit en route in case we have more than one patient? Uh, do you want to put air on, you know, air on air transport on standby? The different agencies require different things. So if your agency requires you to put them on standby, they're not able to respond to somebody else. The reason why that is, as soon as you get there and you're able to let them go, let them go because they need to potentially respond to another, uh, another emergency. Because sometimes that agency, I mean, that air unit is the only one in the area. So that being the case, oops, if you don't need them, clear them as soon as you can once you get on scene. Um, you need that other additional unit and you get there and be like, oh, this really wasn't, an, you know, uh, an ejection. It's, it's one patient. He's out walking around. Cancel your other unit. Be like, hey, you know, dispatch, control, whatever. Cancel the other unit. Uh, we're going to downsize this one. Or, you know, at least pass on information the best you can. So understanding the precautions. So that talks about your number of patients. Um, what does my scene look like? Is it safe for me to enter? If you can't until PD gets there, then just, just wait, but don't go on scene where they can see you because guess what they're gonna do? They're just sitting down there waiting. What they think's going, you know, trust me. Determine the number of patients. We just talked about that. Are we gonna need additional help? So your nature of illness, just your index of suspicion, your awareness of potential serious underlying injuries or illness. Okay, so your NOI, MOI, which is mechanism of injury also, that will that should trigger you in the back of your mind to make a basis. What does this patient potentially need? When I get out of the truck, do I need to go ahead and grab my airway bag, my jump bag, and my drugs? Some agencies, you, don't, you carry your narcotics on you. Some of them, you don't. What do I need based off of what I see? Do I... This car is split in half. I should suspect a trauma patient. Well, that is going to test every bit of your abilities, your knowledge, and your skills. So you need to start thinking as you go. Okay, this batch is telling me this. You know, I got such and such going. I have air on standby. I've got other units en route. They're 15 minutes away. What at this point else do I need to get ready for me? Now, I'll tell you this, none of these things talk about this. If you're the very first unit on scene, you're the last one to leave, which means you are basically the chief in charge until somebody else higher than you and accepts that authority. Just because I show up as a paramedic and I realize, wow, Rob, I'm using Rob, he's right there. Rob, I'm not knocking any skill sets or anybody, is really handling this. Let me take my skills elsewhere. I'm going to let Rob tell me what to do. I, just because we got patches don't mean we're God. Some people think we are, but we're not. So allow, if somebody is like rocking that, okay, let them go. Hey, I just want to double check with you. Are you okay? I'm going to plan on leaving you in charge and handling the other units. Or do you need some other assistance? No, I got this. I appreciate it. Okay, right on, bro. I'm going to let you run with it. But just remember, Follow what your local agency says. If they say, when you get there, you take the most critical patient and leave, you do that, or you stay 
and play the scene out. It may be that that's what they require you to do. And most of your agencies teach you that as you go through their orientation. Uh, some agencies that you go to is to do your ride on may interest, uh, spike interest and like you uh, and they want to they want to try to pick you up. So remember, no matter not only are you representing yourself, you're representing Aries, you're also representing you're doing an interview. You're doing an on-site interview because when we get the feedback of this, they're also going to. When, so at the end of the, your runs and your calls throughout the day, they have to do uh, paperwork on you. How good did you do? Da, 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 and they submit it to us. Well, at the same time, they're going to talk to their field supervisors, to their frontline managers and be like, you know what? This dude was on his game. He knew exactly what he was doing. Can we pick him up? You know, I think he would be a great guy to work with. Blah, 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 blah. So I do recommend that you Make sure you stay on point. Iron your clothes. Look professional. Remember that you could be on the front page of the paper just trying to get your ride a long time with Aries. So, so there's little tidbits in there. Sorry. I kind of get off rabbit holes. Y'all hadn't noticed that. All right. So now we're going diving off into patient assessment. We already talked about developing a general impression. Perform a rapid examination of the patient and quickly determine the patient's level of consciousness. When I touch them, are they alert? awake or oriented okay if they're alert hey man what's going on can you what's the last thing you remember hey do you know where you're at who's this pretty lady sitting next to you it may be their wife could be their sister and you just took your foot in your mouth but at least that they have baseline of what's uh what's going on they have ideas okay so if they're oriented to person place and time they're pretty much going to be on the higher level of the GCS scale. Well, if I'm starting, okay, okay, I get where this patient's going, or they're just completely confused, I'm going to do a rapid head-to-toe exam, and I can still do this as I'm talking to this patient. But like, sir, I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions. As we're doing this, I'm going to be checking you out to make sure there's no other injuries. So I'm going to be touching down your arms, your legs, your abdomen, your stomach, your back, your head, your face. And while we're doing this, smile at me. Put your teeth together. Do you feel like all your teeth are there? You're assessing the patient as you're, and if they follow your directions, they're orientated to what's going on. And as you're assessing this patient, continue to ask them questions. Even if they're confused and they're in and out of consciousness, be like, Fred, I need you to stay with me. Open your eyes. Answer my questions. Where are you hurting? Do multiple tasks as you're doing to get your primary assessment down pat, okay? Uh, quickly determine the patient's level of consciousness. We talked about this, the AVPU scale, and that is A-V-P-U. That's alert, verbal, painful, and unresponsiveness. So that's how I'm gonna check to see what their level of consciousness is. And when you write that, if you write A-V-P-U down, circle which one they are. So if they're only alert to verbal, and painful stimuli, you circle the V and the P. So, and obviously if they're unresponsive at all, you would circle the U. But that is another ability for you to figure out that's, that's more acronyms. If you haven't noticed, EMS is full of acronyms. Yes, sometimes I get confused on them too because different places use different ones, but they should teach you that. But again, this is how you are taught. This is how you know I guarantee you that Rob will assess somebody completely different than I do, but we will both at the end come up with about a one to two differences that how we're going to treat somebody, just the way that he was taught versus I was taught. Not saying either way is wrong. We're going to both come out with the end, and the end game of doing the best for the patient no matter what. But it's okay to be like, well, why is he checking the flexation of his feet maybe he was taught something in a class and realized that bam this can tell me if they have a you know a pelvic fracture okay well after this is over i'm gonna get robbed and show me what the heck he was doing with the you know reflexes and all that who knows but we're going to determine our patient's consciousness by using AFU, no matter what always uh, pfft, always you like that <laughs> airway and breathing um in a conscious patient, ensure the airway is open and they are breathing adequately. 
just because they're breathing doesn't mean that it's adequate to sustain life. So if they have agonal respirations, they need help and help fast. It's and they may not breathe for a couple of seconds in the year. That they need some help. Head tilt, chin lift, uh, jaw thrust, something like that is is your your supply and assistance. Check the respiratory rate. What is the rate, depth, and quality? Are they doing, just because they're sitting in the chair doesn't mean that they're going to have a correct rate, depth, or quality. They may just be breathing like a bag of butt, and you're now there to fix them because I can't breathe. Well, sir, if you'd put the cigarette out while I'm trying to put you on oxygen, that would be amazing. Uh, I can't breathe without it. Well, yeah, yeah, you can. But again, smoke for 80 years, that's all they know. Um, so make sure that they're complete. They take full breaths, count them, uh, see what they are, listen to their breath sounds, make sure their depth is normal. If they're, <laughs> that is not normal. Uh, you want to know, is that good quality or is that just, oh, he, he's not, he's going to be tubed here shortly. Helps you out. Consider applying oxygen in breathing and has been affected. I just told you earlier, always give it to them. It ain't going to hurt them. Give them oxygen. Now, granted, if they do have a respiratory issue, what you're going to do is, <laughs> what they're going to do is, it, you could affect them over time if they are have a severe hypoxia or they're a blue bloater for uh, some other terms. But in the short period of times that we have these patients, just giving them, you know, supplemental oxygen is not going to be bad for them. Uh, for unconscious patients, make sure to open the airway using the proper technique. We talked about the head tilt chin lift or the jaw thrust and make sure uh, that take several seconds to, to evaluate their breathing. Again, what we want to bounce back to is the rate, depth, and quality. Just because I did the head tilt, head tilt, chin lift, are they able to hold it on their own and breathe? Is it adequate for them to do that on their own? Yes, no, whatever else. That's something that we need to, to note. Now, granted, I know y'all are like, oh my God, there's so much that involves in a report. Yes, there is. Um, when we get to report writing, I'm actually going to write a report for you guys that I think is right. Uh, that may be something Rob and I will bounce off each other on writing a full good documentary report. And if you type it out, it, it potentially can take up to several pages when you print it, depending on if it's just a regular, you know, in, inner facility transport from hospital to hospital, you work on a good medical call, or if it's a good trauma, you could write for a long time. Um, I always say if it is a fatality or a trauma code, it's okay for you to take the entire shift to write that out because things will come to you over time. Oh yeah, I remember I did this. Oh, wow, wait, wait, wait. I checked this uh, pulse ox and a sugar at the same time because uh, I did this. So I've had reports that's taken me 24 to 48 hours to write. Um, a death of a friend, a good friend of mine that I worked took me a while and had to get over the shock and then turn around and had to realize that I had to write this report. Um, those are some of the things you have to deal with. Um, but writing a report does take a lot of information. And as you start to see these reports, uh, you have abbreviations and you have uh, different names of something you're not used to. But remember, I'm not going to just use an abbreviation that I made up because that's not what's taken in the medical field. We talked about that earlier in one of the chapters about using approved medical abbreviations because they transfer throughout all the throughout all the uh, medical side. Um, apply oxygen to patients if they're in shock, difficulty with breathing when low oxygen stats are measured. Unconscious patients may need airway adjuncts and ventilatory assistance with a bag valve mask. All right. Again, the easiest thing I can tell you is give them oxygen. Just give it to them. If they feel all right, if it helps, they'll be like, oh, this is driving me nuts. I can't, I can't stand it in my nose. All right, cool. Well, I'm going to turn it off, bro. We're going to take that off of you. I was just seeing if it was going to help you. It's okay. 
if we use these tools of the pull socks or capnography, once you get later on into your career and you understand how to read capnography, it helps you. It's a it's a easy because if you're life back 12, 15, or your uh, Zoles, Philip, all these monitors, if you put a probe on them, like the finger probe, you're going to see respiratory waves. And then over time, just be like, hey, so when we had this patient earlier, what was that little like shark tooth thing? It looks just like a, you know, a shark fin. Or why does that look like a tombstone when they breathe? You know, those things and a good partner should always teach you no matter what. If they don't teach you, maybe that's just them. And they don't, not saying that they don't like you, but they may just not like you. So um, a good, just a reminder, if you have a patient that has less than 94%, always put them on oxygen. That is a set number that you can set in your brain. Be like, oh, he's 94. Let's give him some oxygen. Well, I may not be able to tolerate the nasal cannula in my nose, but I may be able to tolerate a non-rebreather over my face a little bit easier. Or people that can't tolerate the non-rebreather, they may be able to tolerate the nasal cannula. Yes, they are different delivery devices and they different, deliver different qualities of oxygen. But that's okay. At least you're providing oxygen to them. So if you have to do on an unconscious patient and you have to do an airway adjunct and you do a head tilt chin lift, that is perfectly fine. Put that adjunct in. That's why you learn how to do the oral and the nasal pharyngeals because those are tools in your tool bag. But remember, when you have to do this and you're talking about doing it on a a triage scene where there's 50 people laid out there of a mass casualty and you stop and do this with one patient, you potentially have lost three or four more because now you're taking your resources away from this one patient. It's okay to do a head tilt chin lift and a quick rescue breath if they don't start breathing on their own. It's okay to move on. That's what we expect you to do. It's hard. It is very hard. Um, Sometimes it's hard to just watch people that you know that you could have helped. But look, if you stayed with him, you could have lost four more. Well, now you save those four by quick action. Um, if it's just a single patient, a singular patient that's yours, uh, maybe from NBC or you walked in and the patient just fell unconscious, you do everything that's in your powers and it's in your scope of practice to make sure that you do that. Uh, if you turn around and start bagging them and they able to breathe, it's okay. You're doing a great job. You don't want to, you may need to adjust your bagging abilities versus them trying to, you want to breathe when they're pushing air out. So you, you have to adjust to be like, okay, deep breath. Okay. Now I can breathe or let off the bag. Uh, those are different skills that are learned. I, I don't really know how to tell you. Like, oh, you're not going to just automatically, but if, you, if you're squeezing the bag for them to take inhalations and they're exhaling, you're, you're losing a losing battle because the body's trying to push air out. Make sure you bag it, uh, squeeze it when they're trying to take inspiration. It's the proper thing to do, and it works so much easier when you'll do it that way, I promise. Uh, Circularization. Uh, in conscious patients, by checking radio pulse, I observe the patient's skin, color, temp, conditioner. Conditioner. For unconscious patients, assess circulation at the carotid artery. Somebody tell me where the carotid artery is. On the neck. Side of that. Man, y'all are paying attention. There are people in this class. Just because my screen says there's 12 other people in here, I'm going to take Rob out. So there's 11 other people. Man, I'm glad y'all are paying attention. I feel like I'm talking to myself in here. All right. So we want to talk to yourself. Their... Oh, a little bit. You're making little jokes down there in the comments. I'm sitting here trying to not gag, you know, start laughing at you. So, but I appreciate y'all so much. And I want to try to encourage y'all to answer more questions. So I'll try to, I need to learn how to ask more questions as I teach you guys. Um, so in conscious, pa in conscious patients, don't mind me, I'm trying to learn. Oh, come on, Rob, look at him. He's trying to make me feel bad. So what we want to do is look at their color, 
temperature and condition, all right? So what, what's normal? You, you know that you have normal color temperature and condition. You do, you, you have it right now. So you already should know what a baseline is, but when you go to them and they're like, oh, he, he's sticky. Like he just, he's cold. Like what's, what's wrong with him? He may be having signs of shock, all right? Uh, so if you have signs of shock and they're like, mm, I don't, he don't, he just, oh, like he looks ashy. Well, that's a condition. Write that down as a condition. Well, temperature, is he warm or is he cold or is he cool? And is he clammy? Is he normal? So those are the different types of skin condition, color, and temperature that you're going to see. They may be pale, okay? I have seen a, a dark-skinned black man be as white as he can be because we didn't know he had an internal bleed. And we're like, why, why is this man turning white? Uh, well, what's up with this? And thank goodness to a fast response. And we realized what happened when we got there. We were able to fix it. But I can tell you, everybody will turn pale over time. They'll turn, they'll, they'll quit breathing too, and they all turn blue. But you know your basis is what I'm trying to tell y'all is because we now walk around every single day with skin cup color and condition of a basis for all oh, you're checking your skin. For unconscious patients, uh, we have talked about. So you check. So let me ask back to this. We know it's at the side of the neck. Cool, we got that. So how do I check it? Do I wrap my hands around their throat? Do I, what do I, how do I check this for their credit card, uh, card artery? Two fingers on the side of the neck. Okay. Two fingers. And if everybody has never checked theirs, try, try finding yours right now. So, and if y'all don't know, I'm not by no means talking down to anybody, but if you don't know, you feel for your pulse and your neck and you count it for 15 seconds and you times four. Or if you're a simple country Mississippi math like myself, I do it for 30 seconds and I double it. That's easy to me. So depending upon, now y'all take a couple of seconds as I keep talking and type your pulse rate into the chat down there. And we'll actually see if 11 people are paying attention and you do it in there. Let's see, hang on. So I should have 10 people write this down because I don't expect Rob to do it. He's, he's just learning. All right, so we know we have a basis. So we know Kobe's sitting around chilling, sitting there watching, you know, watching me talk, but we got that. So he's found it. Now we, we're good to go. We got a baseline right there. Now I know a pulse. You can do the same thing on a radial, but remember when you check the pulse, if the body's starting to shunt to the core of the body, you may not find a radial or a distal pedal pulse down on their feet. So it's okay to automatically go to the, the, to the neck to check for pulse because it's safer than sorry. If you don't feel one in the neck and they're talking to you, you just haven't found it. I promise you. I've had somebody on a truck tell me, I can't find a pulse. Uh, he's walking to the stretcher. I don't know what you mean. You can't find the pulse. I also had the same student, was a paramedic student. She looked at cardiac monitor, didn't know the rhythm. I'm over there typing on the computer. And that's okay not to know the rhythm. But the patient wasn't doing so good. She turned it off, turned it back on. I said, well, wait, wait a minute, what did you just do? Well, I didn't know the rhythm, and I was hoping if I turned it off and turned it back on, it changed. Oh, no, girl. Mm-mm. That, mm-mm. Mm-mm. Jesus, come get her. She had to go. I had to get off my truck. Can't do that. You can only teach so many people. All right, so transport decision. So I am not going to sit there and read that. I'm just going to tell you, if your gut tells you that, okay, all right, I can, I can stay and play in the back of the truck as we go to the hospital. Robert says, oh, no, it does delete all previous patients. If you're correct, you turn it off and turn it back on, you, you, you lost all your records. You can go get it from your archives, but, so if you're taking your patient to the hospital and you're like, you know what? I can transport Fred without freaking out. We're gonna go 42 to the hospital. No lights, no sirens, we're gonna make it. Can you upgrade at any point in time? Yes. Can you downgrade a call? I uh, probably wouldn't. 
because they're going to be like, I thought you said you were coming like to Science Hospital. It took you 20 minutes to get here and you were just two blocks away. <sighs> okay. All right. I got you. Okay. So, but if you look at him and you're like, oh God, he's squirting out of his arm. Oh, he doesn't have an arm. You're going to want to go lights and sirens. You need to make sure that that critical patient is taken care of, that you need to get that patient to the facility as fast as you can because you, you need to get them to a higher level of care. Hang on one second, guys. So if you go lights and sirens, you're like, you know what, there's a trauma patient, it falls within the criteria, stick with that. Your agencies, like Central Mississippi has, well, Central, Central well, shoot, excuse me, Mississippi has a preset of protocols no matter what. That is what the state pushes out. So your agency can also do protocols and include those or do better. They can't go any lower, but they have to do that or better. That being the case is, what we're saying is, if you say this patient is a GCS of 10, that resorts into a trauma patient in Central Mississippi. You need to go lights and sirens to the hospital because they need more medical intervention than what you got in the back of that box. That's important, all right? But if you're 45 minutes away from the facility, and Fred broke his leg, that possibly is not a lights and sirens transport. Now, if you're just a basic medic truck, that's fine. They've got medications on the truck, they can do that. But if you're just a basic truck, you're not gonna have those narcotics or you know pain relievers to give that. You can't even do, do you can't even get the guy Tylenol on a basic truck. But you may say, okay, well, I'm gonna have the medic meet me at the 10 minute mark and then that medic can take over the patient care and give them morphine blah 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 down the road oh, okay cool those are your things your transport decision is based off of your gut decision and what criteria the patient meets it's hard for me to tell you what every agency rules are because again i don't know where some of you are uh, I have no idea what your agencies you work for. I can speak for the ones that I've worked for and the ones that I currently, which I can't transport nobody where I'm currently at, they got to come get them. So that being said is please, 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 please familiarize yourself with your agency's protocol because they will give you a baseline of what to follow and what to do. And if they turn around and say, you know, if they have this, it has to be licensed iron all the time. If it's this, it is a no lights, no sirens transport. But ultimately, it's your truck. And if you up, if you upgrade a call, you need to let your dispatch know. Be like, hey, you know, unit 116 control, be advised, we're upgrading for 41. I don't know what code y'all use. Y'all may use code one signals. I have no idea. I, I'm just talking. All right. Uh, tell you what, let's take 10 minutes. I will see y'all back at five after. Um, uh, this Diet Coke is running through me, so I'm going to give y'all 10 minutes to uh, be back in a few minutes. All right. Bye-bye.
All right, peeps. So we're back. So here we go. So whom, from what we've done to this point forward, has questions? Um, I know we're supposed to start doing the history, but what do y'all have questions, if any, on from this point from up to this point? Anybody? Rebecca, girl, I know you're being quiet. I know you got a question. I might see. I'm already getting to know y'all already. <laughs> so, I knew I know, <laughs> so I guess because you know I've been watching some videos on um like the assessments. <laughs> uh huh. And um, I guess how like the verbiage and stuff that we're supposed to use like because I know it's I guess what's kind of confusing for me is because we don't have a actual patient like and I'm sure it'll make right. more sense whenever I do my ride-alongs um, actually... well, be before you get there it will make a lot more sense also in a boot camp as you're getting ready to do right. these assessments it should be your time to do training with them um your instructors, hopefully, it's coming up time that I will be able to do some of them with you guys, depending on where y'all are, but that you should be able to do these assessments. And if you're watching your peers, that's still learning. I mean, and you may be like, hey, can there's any way I can bother you like 10 minutes after class? Can we do this with me so I can pick up a few minutes more? But you're correct. It's hard to do without a patient. But at the same time as y'all are students with each other, y'all are more than welcome. I can set this class up at any point in time if y'all wanna get together. I can create breakout rooms in here to where y'all aren't together. Uh, or like there's a couple of y'all back and forth and y'all can talk it out. Uh, Rob's asking a question. Where in the assessment are you struggling? What we can work on that to help to make it better. So looking at these sheets, it does help also that to where you can watch some of these YouTube videos on them breaking down the patient assessment, um, interview uh, patient assessment for National Registry. You can watch individuals do these things. Um, if you want, like break, uh, Rob was saying, we can do a, a step into a breakout room so y'all can talk and maybe he can help it out and do some more adding on here. Um, that's options. We, we have several options with this program. It would probably, Take me a minute to figure out how to make a breakout room, but uh, we can definitely do that. Okay. So the verbiage, Rob, is there anything you want to key in on that? I mean, I know you're, you're being super quiet, but. I guess it really just kind of depends on um, the, like what do you, where exactly is the question? Let's let's do that because the the assessments, you know, they they can be broad. We've already gone over the broad. Now we're starting to kind of get more specific. So where where are you struggling at right this second? We'll work on that. Well, I guess it's just after like the because I know that we're supposed to like go in order and stuff, and I don't want to miss anything. Right. So and, yeah. You're right. Some of your assessment has to be done in order. The good thing is, is the only thing that has to be done in order is your technically your primary. Now, I do like for you guys to get your size up in order, because if you can rock that out line by line, you build momentum and you know you've got everything. So you're not trying to move forward with your primary, which is the most critical thing, while trying to remember what it was that slipped your mind in the size up. So, yeah, your size up in your primary, you want in order. After that, it becomes modular. Your, your vital signs can be done in any order, but they need to be done. Your history can be done in any, any order, but they need to be done. And then even within themselves, you can do whichever one you want first. You just got to make sure you get it all. Like I always say, if you're going to do vital signs first, that's great, but get all your vital signs. Then do, then do your history, that kind of thing. What my instructor taught me was that that piece of paper that they gave us that we practiced on, it's to study the failure so you would know what not to fail. And that can make you more successful on sleep because I have a bad habit of repeating my things like she has said for as an emergency ER format, but I need to do it as in a 
uh, a MT format. So that piece of paper that had like the, the grading scales on there, like the total amount that you get 43. But if you study all the failures, so you know what not to fail, you'll be successful with your registry. That's what I'm learning. Yeah, and if you notice, most of your, your critical fails have to do with messing up your primary assessment, missing BSI scene safety, and either not giving oxygen or just giving the wrong treatment. Like if your scenario is a diabetic and you try to treat a heart attack, that kind of thing. Your, your critical fails are pretty critical. So yes, know them, um, but they're not, they're not that nitty gritty. Most of the nitty gritty is in the actual assessment and you can miss things. That's why each thing's got a point. Um, you're not expected to be perfect. You only need to be perfect in your primary. Um, and then I harp on the size up because like I said, if you can gain that momentum, you gain that confidence of, hey, I just rocked right through my, my size up. I got this as opposed to, oh, I kind of stumbled and I stumbled at the beginning. Now I got to make sure, you know, you don't want that on your mind going through the scenarios. Mm -hmm. um, but we will be doing a ton of these throughout the course. You guys got a, like a taste of it in this first boot camp, and it was all just the, the basic bare bones of it, right? There were no interventions that we didn't really focus on medical or focus on trauma. Um, as you move through the course, you're going to get a lot of experience with this, just going through it in class. And now that you're getting into medical, your next boot camp is still really is more of the same. You're going to do more assessments. They're just going to be focused on medical. You can kind of set trauma to the side, work on medical assessments with some interventions and stuff like that. And you'll see how it actually, how it flows. You'll continue to refine your, um, your assessments in general. And then you're going to do it all again with trauma. And you can do it all again with um, special populations, you know, peds, geriatrics, that kind of thing. So yeah, I, I expect it to be hard. Most people struggle with the assessments in general, but don't let it discourage you. Y'all are still pretty early in the game here. You know, module two is your first touch of the assessment and then you're in module three. So yeah, this is all still new to y'all. Okay. How's that help? I mean, that's, you're, I mean, it's a building block for everything. When we start small, like you brought up about the pediatrics, the geriatrics, it's just a building block for everybody to keep moving forward. So yes, it is sometimes you get concerned or overwhelmed, we get that. Trust us, we've all been there. So again, when that happens, it's not your fault, but please let us know. That's what we have Discord, that's what we have these group ones on here to help everybody out. Um, Stammer says, I'm just worried about getting it in order and not forgetting steps. So, yes, and like Rob pointed, that that's something that we're going to work on continuous. Well, it's building blocks. Uh, we're going to start you out with Legos, and then we're going to move you to Lincoln Logs, and then we're going to get you prepped and ready for National Registry. So it's not something that we give you these sheets and be like, you're on your own, bro. We, we want to teach you, but we need to know why you're getting a history. What, what, what's that going to do for me? Why am I asking, do you have any allergies? So we teach you this. So then when you do your primary assessment for your medical patient, that it helps. Um, Y'all yeah, hang on one second real quick. Give me just a second. Sorry about that. I thought my dog was supposed to eat our back door. All right. So Rose says, uh, like, if you have kids, you can apply the assessment to them. If you have an accident or whatnot, I ended up doing it right after the boot camp. It was something simple, but I turned it into something I could use for this. It's fine. It's the same way. Yeah. You put the dogs out. Sorry. Um, so when you have these things, it's just, I, it's building blocks. So like when you learn it, you come home and be like, significant other, you're now a patient. Be still, I'm going to go from head to toe a full assessment, and you you build it. Uh, yeah, they're going to kind of giggle and laugh and all that, but they don't have a choice, I can tell you. Uh, interventions, yeah, yeah, like Rob saying, not necessarily uh, right now, but you need to understand when it's time to put those in place and see when it's like, hey, I'm ready to do this. Let's move forward. We're going to go into 
how we put these things into play and you know you can do your head tilt chin lift in your assessment okay so hoping that we're there i'm going to kick it off with how do we determine their history all right so when you ask what their history is I don't want to know what you did in fourth grade when you broke your right arm and how it caused you to find out that you were scared of heights. I, I don't want to know that. But what I like to ask people is, do you have high sugar, low sugar? Do you have any type of cancer, diabetes, respiratory issues, things that you see a medical doctor on a regular basis for? So, and then I say, okay, what has made those signs and symptoms worse in the past year or two. So I'm building a history on those, but at the same time as I'm going to go through their history, okay, so when were you diagnosed with cancer? When were you diagnosed with uh, the sugar problems? What do you take for the sugar problems? Are you in remission from you can't, you know, that's some of the things that you build. For an unconscious patient, yeah, you're kind of like me. We're just going to pull cards out and go for what we see. I don't really know, but we're going to guess at it. I can't dive into their history unless they have a medical bracelet. Um, I will tell you, I had a smart aleck friend of mine. He refused to wear medical bracelets at all, but he had it tattooed on him. So just look for something that is not supposed to be there that just doesn't look like it's like, why is it written all down his arm? He's just that guy. You got to know him. Um, so histories, obtain a sample history. So these are your mnemonics that I'm telling you it's going to be important. So sample, uh, it's S-A-M-P-L-E, so that is signs, uh, allergies. I just went blank if my S is not signs, it's allergies, Jim, Jim. medication. <laughs> what is that? Signs and symptoms. Yes, yeah, signs and symptoms, allergies, medications, past pertinent, pertinent history. What is important? What was the last very most important thing that happened in your medical history? Last time you eat and everything else, that's the way I was taught it, okay? So then you have your OPQRST. Uh, does somebody know what OP, OPQRST stands for? Hello in the back. On set. Mm -hmm. Provocation. <laughs> Quality. Mm -hmm. uh, Radiation, okay. severity, and time. Okay, so the onset, when did this happen? When, how long have you been in pain? If they're like, well, it started at two o'clock this morning. Baby girl, it's six o'clock at night. What, why, why'd you wait? What's the deal? Well, I didn't want to bother nobody and it just got worse. A lot of your elderly people always get into the point to where they're I just don't want to bother nobody. Baby, you know I get paid to do this. It's okay. And then in the back of your mind, you're like, but you didn't have to call at like 2.30 in the morning. But, you know, so so your, your quality, I need to know what, how is it a constant pain? Is it like describe it to me and point it with one finger exactly where it's at? Severity is the same thing. And then what time? I mean, now, granted, you are interviewing this patient at, you know, 1919 at night, but you need to know when it started, how long ago this was been happened two days ago. Uh, okay, does anything make it better? Does it make it worse? Uh, when's, you know, you sometimes you just got to even get down to when's the last time they had bowel movement? Okay, was it solid? You know, was your urine clear? You know, or was it yellow or brown? You know, those are the things that you get into a sample history. Uh, or into a, basically a history overall. So record any allergies, medications, and medical conditions. So allergies are super important too, but be careful when you, and they tell you, oh, I'm allergic to morphine. Okay, cool. What does morphine make you do? Well, I itch all over. No, that's, that's not an allergy. That's a side effect. So I have medicine. I can fix that. I promise you. Well, I don't want it. Well, guess what? You're not getting no pain medicine. So Understand and ask them, is that a side effect or, or do you know by a medical doctor or an allergy doctor that you're allergic to this, okay? Medical conditions. I had a girl uh, talk to me today uh, that has a very rare, she's like, hey, Chris, I just got diagnosed with this. Can you tell me information? I was like, 
Um, uh, I don't, I don't know what that is. Uh, I don't know. I told us to Google it. Well, I've always known you. You'd be smart at stuff, and I just want to see if you knew what it was. No, no, I, no. I don't have MD. I have paramedic after my name. I'm at the bottom of the food chain. So, and what medications? Again, they may give you this big old bag of medicines, and you're like, what am I supposed to do with all this? You're supposed to write down medications that are provided to the patient. Some patients take numerous medications. They take medications uh, with you to the hospital. So you want to take them because, Rebecca, I don't even remember what she said because like, I didn't even Google it. I just straight up told her, I don't know. Like, I have no idea. You're going to have to you're gonna have to Google it. I haven't been the best today. I still don't feel well. So I'm sure my tone when I spoke to her was not the nicest in the world. So that being the case, um, the reason why you want to take these medications to the hospital is some of these physicians and some of these nurses just want, they need to know the dosages. They have all the medicines in the world in the pharmacy, but they may say, oh, well, you're on 10 of this and five of that. Well, if you're on 50 of this. Well, that's this medication's overriding this one. So that may be why you're feeling so bad because just because they have 18 different doctors don't mean that those 18 different doctors communicate or read each other's charts. So what they prescribe to that patient may not be doing anything because of the other medicine or it could be triggering some other reactions. So just because it's in your medical chart doesn't mean that it goes to every facility that you go to. So that's why it's important to take your medications with you. So your secondary assessment, unless there's a reason why you're stuck on scene and you can't do anything on the way there. You know what? Um, so if you, unless you're taken on scene and you're sitting there, then you can do a secondary assessment. But 99% of the time you wanna do your secondary on the way to, uh, um, you want to do it on the way to the hospital because now you're, you want to assess it again, but this is more of a slow, detailed assessment. You can take their time. Uh, you can check, you know, you can decap BTLS. I don't think we've gone over that yet, but you can do a QPRST on every part then. You're going to go take your, you're not, this is literally slow. It can take five, 10, 15 minutes to do head to toe. And then when you're done, document everything you can and start over. Continually monitor your patient on the way to the hospital. It doesn't stop just because you did the secondary assessment, but this is, this, it's just what you're, it's the order that we're teaching you this because it's a continuous monitoring of your patient and assessment. Physical exam. All conscious patients should undergo a limited uh, or detailed physical exam. So if you have your back patient that is strapped onto a backboard, you're not going to continuously be able to, um, this is where they mean limited, you're not going to continuously be able to uh, check their back and, you know, assess their back because they're on a backboard. Okay, but you do a very good assessment the first time. So when you put them on the backboard and secure them, that you know that you just hope things have not changed. Now you can run your hands on some void places and check their lower back, make sure that you don't have anything that's penetrating or that's something that's gotten, uh, you know, spoke them as you're trying to move them. Unconscious patients, you want to always perform a secondary assessment for the entire body head to toe. A full body assessment should help you obtain clues and you should be able to perform quickly so it does not delay transport. So your rapid assessment is done as you're building your notes in your head to say, okay, this is going to be a trauma patient because this, this, and this mechanism of injury. Note, keep going. So that is helping you build up your transportation decision. I know it's a lot. And y'all are probably thinking, oh my God, he just keeps talking. But it's information that, we, that you need to know that's going to help you build your assessments as you go throughout here. Uh, what's the, okay. Um, physical, physical exam. Again, we talk about this. Examine the head, scalp, and face. 
examine the neck closely. What you want to look for on the neck is there's no, so if you'll, everybody look straight ahead, grab your center of your throat, that's your trachea. We want to make sure that's midline. You know that's the center part of your body. You can feel it. You're like, ah, okay. And you know that's there. What I want you to do is a basic. And just know is that no matter what, when you examine somebody's neck, that that's always midline. If you realize that it's one side or the other, you're going to be like, oh, God, I don't know what Chris didn't tell me what to do now. But that is normal for it to be center midline of the body. That's when you assess the neck, check there and make sure that your cricoid pulse is not bulging. Just make sure it's not sticking out. It doesn't have any bulge. And it's not like, oh my God, there's a lot of back pressure that's making their cricoid arteries very big. Like, I don't know what to do. Note that there's nothing you can do as a basic level because the pressure is so high. Or even if their trachea is shifted, you can't do anything just yet. That's more of a higher level of fear. Assess the chest and abdomen. Now, again, I've told y'all before, you're just gonna have to expose that. I can't assess something if I can't see it. So, but remember, if somebody's mother, daughter, sister, brother, father, uncle, that somebody's family, so respect their privacy. I don't want to expose them so I can assess their chest in the middle of Walmart. And that's not the proper place to do it. When I get in the back of my ambulance, I can close the doors. I can assess them properly there. Um, palpate the legs and arms. I want to physically put my hands on there and I want to squeeze and touch to make sure that everything's intact. Be like, sir, Mr. Fred, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to squeeze your legs as I go down. Tell me, can you feel this? Yes. What about this? Yes. What about that? Can you wiggle your toes for me? Thank you, Mr. Fred. I'll move to the other side. Can you feel this? Yes. Can you feel that? And he and they go, no. And you're like, wait, what'd you say? That's your assessment of building your uh, extremities. Same thing for your legs. And I mean, uh, for the legs and the arms, literally, I want you to feel it. I want you to squeeze it, touch it. You cannot do a good assessment if you don't put your hands on it. If you don't put your hands on it, you did not assess it. Now, granted, Please don't think, well, you didn't assess his brain when you were checking his mental status, but I asked questions. I was able to ask their questions that they were able to answer correctly. Um, examine the patient's back. I, like I said there, what you want to do is you want to assess that very, very good the first time when you go to put them on a, a, a backboard or a KED or if you want to if you don't have to board them, it, it's going to be difficult for you to constantly every five or 10 minutes be like, sir, can you step up and you check your back? Bro, how many times are you going to check my back? I'm having trouble breathing, not my back hurts. So that being the case is just do a good assessment upon their back the first time. And it's just going to have to ride the way that it is. Um, vital signs. I'm asking y'all now, why is it important for me to get a baseline vital? So that you know where you're starting. Okay. Got to start somewhere, right? You didn't learn how to tie your shoes on the get-go. That was a process. So it's the same thing with vitals. I, I got I to gotta introduce myself. I'm introducing myself to the same thing as getting a good, good blood pressure. Because where if I look at it and it's like 250 over 190 and you're like, oh, shit. I, oh, oh, God. Well, maybe you didn't have the correct cuff on. Maybe you should take that jacket off when you check their blood pressure. Right? Um, things like that. Those are some of the things that can help you build your basis. Um, you get a good baseline. You know where you start. I, the way that I do it, uh, this is a Chris Wally thing. I document my very first one and I do every other one after that. Um, even though it is a, five to 10, you know, five minutes on critical, nine criticals every 10 minutes, but I always document every other one. And if there's, if I do a, a, if I provide a skill, like if I give an IV, I always start the IV, check the blood pressure. It's just a habit. Uh, I like to stay on top of my thing to where if I notice there's a change, like if I uh, pre giving them medication, I'll check their blood pressure. And then two to three minutes post 
giving the medication, I'll check your blood pressure. And that still falls in my every other one. But I note blood pressure taken due to the difference of time due to medication provided at time, blood pressure was blah, 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 blah. So um, consider same blood glucose level. Okay, so stick your fingers. Ah, it's easy. I mean, that's a basic skill. I want to know what their sugar, I want to know how sugar they are. If they sweet, are they they low, they high, I need to know. It, it's a good baseline, okay? Uh, that's a good thing because if you give, maybe you can have all that ready and then your advanced or your paramedic shows up and be like, hey, they just need some D5 or D50. And they're like, well, how, does, how, how, how do you know? Well, I'm good at what I do. You do your job. No, I'm just kidding. Don't be, don't be like that. Let, let Chris Waller be like that. All right. So when I reassess this patient, um, when I'm reassessing, what I want to make sure is check all your interventions, double check your interventions, make sure things are on point, and document all the changes. Yes, these reports can be lengthy. Yes, they can be big. But if you do something, you need to check it and document it. So at uh, 1930, IV was established. At 1932, IV was reassessed once it was secured. Uh, IV was flowing at such and such rate. Boom, done. Or at your level, uh, tourniquet was applied uh, to left arm high and tight. Um, no, um, no pulse was found. No um, scorting. You know, there was no arterial bleed noted. Um, it was reassessed at such and such time. That way it is it helps you. It, it just builds these basis for you to document off of. Um, document any changes that have developed in result of a treatment and if any needs of adjustment and treatments accordingly. So if you put them on six liters, let's put them on four liters of nasal cannula. Okay, cool. We got that. We're ready to roll. But if you notice there, don't eat over the food. If you notice that there's a change and they're like, well, I can't get their O2 sats up. Maybe you need to change their uh, oxygen delivery system. Maybe they do need a non-rebreather and put them at 10 to 12 liters a minute. And if you notice changes, document what you found, document your thing, and then turn around um, and then document what you changed them to and your findings. Once you find those findings and it's working, okay, then you fix the problem. So that's cool. Uh, all right, Rob, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, oh, he's already left. All right, so ma manage transportation and destination. So what do I want to know about here? What this? Do you need to try get them to the right appropriate uh, facility? Well, what's wrong with you? My son's over there making faces at me. All right. So uh, let's see here. It is saying maybe on uh, most medical emergencies require a level of treatment beyond that uh, available in a pre-hospital setting. May require advanced testing. So get your patient to the most appropriate facility. If it is a trauma patient in the central Mississippi area, let me tell you what it does here. I don't want to talk about your, your state, your town, because I don't know. But here, if it is a trauma patient, you go to the most closest facility. Now, granted, have I passed those facilities up? Yes, because I felt at the time that I could take care of this patient's needs until I got to our trauma center. That is a personal thing. That is something that I have been scolded for. I have learned, I have been burned about that, but... At the same time, I'm doing the best for the patient. Now, if it is a cardiac arrest, you take that patient to the closest facility no matter what. Because again, they still have physicians, respiratory techs, and other things like that that can benefit that patient. Now, trauma is going to be a little different. So sometimes you need to call for air versus trying to transport that patient 15 minutes by ground. It may take them eight minutes to get there but then again you've got fpc paramedics flight paramedics uh you have critical care nurses things like that are already on those board on board that you just don't have in the back of your truck and it's the benefit of that patient 
So, um, scene time. You don't want to be on scene any longer than you have to. Now, granted, it is not saying that you don't know what you're doing. It's not saying that you don't have the ability to fix the patient. What it's saying is, is the faster that we can get them to the, the most appropriate facility is the best thing that we can do for them. So minimizing our own scene time is the most appropriate thing that we can do as care providers, okay? So uh, critical patients will always need rapid transport if they have altered mental statuses, airway or breathing difficulties, any signs of circulatory compromise, and the very old or the very young. Because I can tell you all right now, not many people on the streets of America like dealing with pediatrics. That's just it. So they're like, oh, God, it's a ped. Let's hurry up and go. Well, maybe you can fix that, but you just choose to, you know, like, okay, let's go. Screw it. We're not going to sit around and wait. We're, we're going to get this done like right now. So it's okay to be like that, but, you know, make sure you justify why you're transporting that. So type of transport, life-threatening conditions always go lights and sirens. Non-life-threatening conditions consider non-emergency transport. So again, you need to make sure you know what your agencies say before you're like, oh, there's always gonna be a you know, lights and sirens because that agency may not, that may not fall within their windows. Uh, here's a ground transport unit, Boston EMS is a very, it's a pretty unique thing. Um, uh, New York EMS, I had a, I got to know a guy on my rig that was from New York and he was a paramedic up there and explained some of the things for those facilities up there. So you don't have a lot of transport time and the way that they just do their EMS is way different than what I'm used to. So it was just like, oh my God, that's crazy. But everybody knows what a regular ground transport is. Here's a picture of an air transport. Um, Different places, different people, different strokes. This is the one thing I can point out to you here. This is a one pilot here. So this is always gonna be on ground. Anytime that they go over water or they go uh, offshore, you have to have dual pilots and dual engines. That is a single or uh, no, as a dual, but you have to have um, dual pilots. That's just F FAA requirement. Um, nurse paramedic are most of the time what you see on these facilities. Uh, on these, uh, sorry, not facilities, but these types of transports. Um, you're also getting to where you see a lot of ground critical care trucks. A lot of these critical care trucks can transport. Now they will still run 911s like the rest of them, but they can transport different medications coming out of this facility. They can have different types of, um, they have ventilators on there that may not be on your regular ground, ground truck. So you'll see a lot of those too. Um, where it says destination selection, it is normally your closest, but at the same time is where I'm at, patients get to choose their facility on a non-critical situation. If it is something that is critical or life-threatening, they don't make the decisions no more, and I do. And I'll tell them, hey, listen, I respect your decision to go to Baptist Hospital, but at this point in time, I believe for your, for the betterment of you, you need to go to our trauma facility, and here's why. I understand you don't like my decision, but that's my decision. We can talk about this later. Once you're discharged, we'll talk about it. And I ain't never going to see him again. I don't really care. But you need to make the best decision for them. Um, are infectious diseases. So if you, if you know that they have infectious diseases, that's, that's the better part. But if you don't know, then you, you kind of, you still need to make sure that you have all of your um, PPE on, everything is appropriately done, um, that you, you still treat them like human beings. They're not anything unspecial. Now, granted with COVID, um, everybody wears masks these days, depends on what type of mask you may have. It could be just a normal uh, KN95 or N95, or you could have a full face respirator. So just know when you're talking with somebody, it's going to be very hard to, you know, to speak and for them to hear you. Um, infectious diseases, it's still going to assess them the same way. I'm not trying to go over that again. Um, again, focus on any life-threatening conditions. That's going to be your primary goal. Be very sympathetic. Um, 
<laughs> you don't be like, oh, well, you shouldn't have been smoking for 40 years. Wouldn't have put you on that thing. Yeah, come on. That's not how we are in EMS. We're not supposed to be like that. We're the frontline care providers that we need to take care of people. Um, epidemic and pandemic considerations. Man, we're living in that right now. I, I don't know what I need to tell y'all about that. Y'all live in it every single day. You see it, you, you hear it, you read it, you smell it, you breathe it. No matter what, we're dealing with this. I, I don't know. This is the first one for myself. I'm sure all of you guys going through a pandemic and epidemic that we're learning. Uh, influenza, that's the flu. You can't have the flu these days. It's got to be COVID. You cannot have the flu. I'm sticking. Actually, my one of my physicians here recently, he, he I called him. He was like, oh, I can't breathe. I was like, you're sure you got the COVID. Oh, it's an influenza. I said, no, you can't have that these days. And we laughed and cut up about that. But it's the same thing. If we know it's flu season, we need to wear a mask. I do believe in the mask. They are aggravating. Uh, they do aggravate you sometimes. I know it can affect your breathing and the way that you are. But understand, they do protect you. They do. I mean, most of your people, when not being ugly, are nasty. They, they, they wrote. Uh, I don't, I don't like shaking hands. I don't know where your hands are being. I don't, I don't want to touch the same thing you've been touching. I don't know if you went to the bathroom and washed your hands or not. I'm going to fist bump you, bro. Sorry. It's the same thing. Uh, influenza. I kind of like my PPE. I like to breathe. So I'm going to make sure I wash my hands. That's the best thing you can do, y'all. And then if you go to transport somebody, place that surgical mask on the patient. It's okay. If you know that they have a respiratory disease, it's okay to put that on them. It's not saying that, oh, we can't, we can't do that. No, I think a lot of the etiquette has been going out. Um, it is, it's, uh, it's to the point to where now it's like, that's kind of expected that everybody wears masks. Uh, your, your belief or not, if you want to go to a private facility and they require masks, you got to put it on. If you don't want to, then you don't, you don't have to have the right to be served. So, and the same thing, if you want to be transporting my ambulance, you're going to put this mask on for your safety and mine. I don't want to give you anything that I have, and I don't want you to give me anything. So, herpes simplex, um, I don't really know a whole lot about that. I know it does cause more illness than pneumonia and meningitis in the very young and old. Um, they, it's gross. Again, it's commonly caused and carried by humans. It's gross. Uh, so much I know that it's given through close contacts. Uh, you know, I, don't, I don't like it. I don't want it. I've taken care of several patients that have HIV and AIDS. Um, a lot of times they will tell you. Uh, they will tell you once they're alone. Uh, and they're like, hey, I know before you start the IV, I just want you to know I have HIV. Okay, thank you for telling me. I'm going to take the same precautions as I would before, but I'm still going to start this IV on you, okay? We're just going to be a little bit more careful, and we're going to go a little bit slower. Uh, they most of the time tell you, and they don't want to because they they do feel bad, uh, but they want to make sure that they watch out for you. Um, but don't let them see your face like, oh, God, he's got HIV. Come on, bro. They, they call them because they need something, not because of what they have. Uh, most of the time, your severe HIV patients that are untreated are really sick. They're pretty sick all the time. So just limit your exposure. I mean, if you do happen to have a needle stick by that patient, you need to make sure you document that and notify the, the corrective people at the right time. Um, so a lot of patients with HIV don't show symptoms. Um, but no matter what, you're always going to wear the proper PPE, period. If you don't wear it and you get injured or sick, that's the first thing that a company's going to ask you. Where you wear your where were you wearing your proper PPE? I promise you, I see it day in and day out when I'm at work. Day in and day out. Did they have the proper gloves on? Did they have the proper eye protection on? They're like, bruh, I don't know. They came into the clinic and here they are. I don't know. So companies will do that constantly. Um, hepatitis, this is uh, affects the liver. Um, let's see here. There's no sure way to tell which hepatitis patients are contagious. A hepatitis A can be transmitted only from patients who has an acute infection, where hepatitis B and C can be transmitted from long-term care who has no signs of illness. A carrier is a person or animal who an infectious organism has taken up permanent residence and may or may not cause an active disease. 
Hepatitis A is transmitted orally through oral or fecal contamination. Hepatitis B is far more contagious than HIV. Vaccinations with hepatitis B vaccine is highly recommended for EMTs. I like to throw in here too, pink eye. You know what that tells me as an individual? You don't wash your hands because you got poop in your eye. Period. Period. I don't care what that's what you got poop in your eye. That's why you got the pink eye. Come on, bro. All right, so here's some other pretty cool and uh, important characteristics of hepatitis. It breaks down A, B, C, and D. Um, gives you some data, some a little bit of more knowledge about it there. The incubation period, how long it sits and bakes before you start to see issues. Uh, meningitis is pretty nifty to see. Um, uh, inflammation of the meningeal covering of the brain and spinal cord. Um, worst patients, you can kind of see them. Uh, they they, they kind of just lose their mind and the control of everything. Um, you can treat it with uh, antibiotics, but uh, that is kind of one of those things that's rarely seen unless you go from another third world country back to the U.S. They ask a lot about that, um, about where you've been. Uh, TB, I have had exposures to TB. I've taken that medication for a year, couldn't drink no alcohol. Size of that pill is like a, it's huge, as big as pill I've ever swallowed in my life. Um, sometimes people just don't know they have it, or if they do, they just rude, crude, and ugly and don't say anything. But if you do, make sure you put that patient in a, uh, a surgical mask. You need to wear a, an N95 or a HEPA mask uh, because it is droplets. It is something that is aired. Uh, you can't see those droplets. The same thing with COVID is transmitted through uh, droplets. So being precautious of that is there. Uh, Rebecca, my two-year-old, had a TB Kinsteth eight months ago, tested positive. So just remember uh, with the TB, it wants you ever um, test positive, you can never do the skin test again. So they have to do the chest x-rays from there. Um, so that's something that you just keep in the back of your mind there that no matter what, they always have to take that x-ray. And it's just something that they just tell your kids and your, you know, and the other patients that you just got to smile for the chest. They just want to see, they want to take bigger and better precautions. It's the TB. It's, it's scary. I'm somebody that doesn't know a whole lot about it. Um, let's see here. Preventive therapy is almost 100% effective. Uh, skin tests are regular. Some agencies require them every year. Um, EMS. And then if you've had exposure and you know you've been exposed to TB, they will, uh, give you a test within a reasonable period of time. Whooping cough, uh, symptoms include fever and a whoop, sounds that occurs in inhalation, inhaling after a coughing attack. The best way to prevent exposure is to be vaccinated, place a mask over your patient or your cells. Uh, you can have the, uh, the DD, DPT shot or the Tdap uh, if it's further longer than that. Uh, you can have those or some of your uh, vaccines. Uh, let's see, Rebecca says she had a lymph node in large portion. Oh, Lord. Uh, medication, I'm assuming, was given for that, Rebecca. A lot of antibiotics. Oh, oh. Okay, then. Oh, I hate to hear that. Probably to what? To remove the lymph node or? Yeah, they gave us multiple options. At first, they said that they were going to remove it. Then they said, no, we'll just wait a little longer. And they also gave us the option of doing two or three different antibiotics like three times a day for the next six months to a year. But they it's said that, that, yeah, and they were like, but that's not a guarantee that it'll go away. And so they said, so we went back and did another consult with the surgeon and she was like, no, I think I'm going to leave it alone. So, yeah, they said that she would just outgrow it. So I'm like, what? Uh, <laughs> I get it. Sometimes you're just like, this makes no sense. Um, but again, that's why they go to MD school and I don't. Um, I wish I had the money and the time, but that was a whole nother life ago. Um, let's see. Well, I wish the best for her. I hope everything's good for your, for your little girl. Oh, she's doing fine. Uh, <laughs> great. 
Um, MRSA, um, if most of the time you will see those in the hospital. Um, you will see that you're transporting an MSRA patient to and from home. And I'll tell you, gown up. If they tell you the patient has there, sometimes don't do it in front of the patient, but lay an extra covering over your stretcher. Uh, you want to make sure you wipe down anything that that patient touches because it's easily transmitted um, from the staphylococcus. That one gets me all the time, the MRSA. So just make sure you, you know, clean up very well after that patient. Um, it is they, it is done by uh, heavy antibiotics, but they do treat it by antibiotic therapy. So uh, you can get them pretty regular through uh, um, prolonged hospital stays. I've known people that um, get them through MSRA through nasty tattoo shops. Uh, nasty piercings. Um, people have got them from weed eating in shorts and they get the infection in their leg. I've seen it all. I've seen people lose their legs for me. So it, it's nasty. It's, it's uh, right there. You'll see. Oh, you don't see that. Sorry. Um, some lo some of the signs and symptoms, localized skin abscesses and sepsis is old in, uh, in older patients. So the, the skin uh, uh, abscesses is kind of your, your trigger sign, but like, what? Well, was that what, what you got right there? So and it's okay to be like, listen, at this point, my partner and I, we're going to step back. We're going to put on a few things. Just we want to be cautious about. So, but just don't make the patient feel so bad. Oh, I didn't know this was in here. So COVID-19, we talked about that. Um, we know uh, they see it's even in this book saying it originated in the Wuhan laboratory. Um, it's quickly spread. We know, and and so let me break this down. I, I am not a, I am not an anti-vaxxer. I want people to make the most educated decision that you can for yourself and do what you have to do. Um, but again, understanding how viruses change, we could not help but expect to see different strands of this virus. Um, what I have versus given, uh, if I expose Rebecca and then she turns around and exposes Colby, we're, we're all going to potentially have small types of different strands. And if that's the case, um, we're going to see different things as they come through there. So knowing how we've seen that and the different strands, I get it. I understand that part but if you look at it it's still a in it's an influenza attack now granted i don't want to get in the, in the case of everything i don't want to get in the case of anything maybe uh you want to talk about you know uh, i this is a touchy topic because i don't I don't want to poke anybody on my side versus the other side, but I'll straight up tell you, I personally was against the vaccine. I want, I did not want to take it. I didn't want to expose my family. I believed in herd immunity. I still believe in herd immunity. My wife and I both have had COVID. All three of our kids were in the house. They did not get COVID from us. Um, I was forced to take the vaccine because if I don't take it, I can't return to work. And it's, I can make a decision and not return to work, yes. But again, it's ultimately, I got to put groceries on the table. I got to pay for, you know, room and board and books and all this other stuff. So that's something that I and my wife had to sit down and talk about. We had to be comfortable with. I'm not comfortable with the decision. But I really didn't have a choice. Kind of want to return to work. Um, Google other health issues. You do have the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. That is another type of coronavirus um, that is very well known in the Middle East. Um, there, there are no cures or vaccines for this. Um, they do lose a lot of individuals in the Middle East, but that is not documented because of the their their healthcare system is very, very, very poor. I have seen that very. I've seen that firsthand. It's very poor. Um, you should not take care of somebody with this because a lot of times that is a CDC thing and they're escorted out in these big bubbles and all this stuff. So seeing the Middle East, uh, co the coronavirus is very 
very difficult and very different. Um, Ebola, I've taken care of Ebola patients. I've had the Ebola training. Um, this was the outbreak that was going to end the world in 2014. Um, you did know people would uh, just completely bleed out. Uh, we've had people that were healed from it um, due to different medications. It did have a fatality rate of 70%. Um, so, I mean, that, that was supposed to kill the world, but, you know, we saved ourselves from that one. Uh, we talk about travel medicine. If you know that you're going to travel and you're traveling outside of the United States, you need to be prepared for that third world medication. Um, if you go to Mexico, some, you can buy a lot of our prescriptions over the counter, right there over the counter on the street drugs. Um, prime example, when I was in the Middle East, you could buy, walk up to the counter and buy Viagra like you buy on Tylenol, buy the bottle, buy the peel, it didn't matter. So other countries have different things. Um, they may tell you to go to the group, to the pharmacist to get this. Well, you're not going to the pharmacist like we think. So I tell you and encourage you, if you go outside of the U.S. on any type of you know, mission trip, you know, anything like that, you need to take somebody with you that is very medically uh, knowledgeable um, and has the medications to take with you. Uh, some countries and some places may require you to take medicines and vaccines prior to you getting there. Um, and you do have to have another vaccine card. I mean, obviously these, everybody now, is, it's just the COVID thing. You can't come in without the vaccine and uh, you can't travel and all this stuff, but just know certain types, certain countries and parts of the world are not going to allow you um, with that. Um, other travel ones, where did you travel? This is important when you come back uh, from meningitis, things like that. Um, what types of food did you eat? Did you eat any, you know, like local foods? Be very careful if you travel outside and it's an uncooked food. You don't know what it is. You think it's a nut and it's actually like an animal heart. Uh, I'm telling you, I've seen it. Um, were you exposed to any infectious diseases? These are some of the questions that they ask you. Um, I saw a lot of these questions when we were dealing with Ebola, the swine flu and the bird flu that we've all survived, we've all been through. Um, so no. Those questions are potentially coming. And then when you enter and exit other countries, it's the same thing. Um, oh, look at there, the conclusion. I, so, I know it's a weird one, but I had a... I know it's weird, but I had a history before. Uh, yeah, that's, and you know, that is something that's, that's, not, that's not common. It is rare, but they do treat that. They can take care of it at the local hospital um five medications um uh, let's see i'm trying to remember what the big um what they normally treat for salmonella or e coli uh actually in one of our little towns here they have a it's called the yogi bear park they actually just had a outbreak of that i'm assuming that they uh Changed all the water in the in the splash pads. <laughs> so um, I remember don't just delay in the from, like the Oregon Trail game. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah, it killed it killed <laughs> the whole group. Yeah, we're showing our age on that one, ain't we? We both because we both know what it is. So, um, but knowing that, knowing what's out there, having ideas and different things builds us the ability to treat our patients. Um, living through this, and then when we get to the point where we're taking care of kids, now they're adults, you're like, oh, I remember the COVID days, and you're like, wait, what? You know, th those are different things. Um, remember your head-to-toe assessment. Remember your detailed body assessment. So now that you start doing these skills, these hands-on practices on your paperwork, that they're starting to make more sense, and understanding why you do this in the patient assessment hopefully now educates you and gets you prepared for these things. And they're not just sheets with a bunch of letters and you're like, oh my God, if I say at the bottom, I'm going to fail. What if I don't say BSI? Well, you, yes, you didn't say that, but it doesn't mean that you can't be like, you know what? I completely forgot. As soon as we walked in, I did have my BSI. I had my gloves on. I just did not say BSI. Seems safe. Okay, you, you said it, you're done. Put a check in the box. 
So it's not like it has to be in a complete order, but it is very easy for us as adults and humans to remember things in order in particular steps. That's why we put it that way and that's why it's pushed. Whew. All right, folks, I've had y'all for about two hours. Y'all have any questions, concerns? I don't really wanna hear your complaints. No, I'm just kidding. If y'all have anything, please let me know. Do y'all have anything y'all wanna go over or talk about extra? Um, so give us a little bit. We are going to try to get your, um, Rebecca, that's weird. You ain't going to put, no, it's picking, baby. Um, so give us a little bit. We are in the process of changing the, uh, the test over. So uh, I want to make sure you get your correct time versus, so it would expire tomorrow if y'all, I didn't change anything. So we're going to get that adjusted. You may not be able to take your test the first thing in the morning. So, but give us just a little while. Um, we'll, myself or Rob, will let y'all know when it's done. And this, hold on, didn't, what chapter is this? Just this, uh, 15 or 14? 14, 14, chapter 15. All right, sorry. I had to go back and look at my notes. All right, so let me give you the class code. Yes, um, I responded to you. Um, I don't know if you saw that. So this is for yes. Yeah, so the book that. has it listed. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't have. I didn't get you. I didn't shoot me a message in Discord. Maybe maybe I forgot. You I read it. And I just didn't follow along. So Thank the you. book has it as fifteen. Um, but it goes off, it, it is 14 because I had to change the test and all that. So your class code tonight, because I didn't put it in, didn't have time, um, I'm going to type it. Hold on. Oh, uh, that's not the right one. Stand by. I got to go. Do y'all remember, and my memory sucks, I'm sorry, what the last class code I gave y'all? Just a second, I can tell you. Please. Just give me the first three, and I'll go from there, and I'll know. Mm. That's the right I had a question while you're it's, looking through that. Yeah. yeah. What Samantha said. I'm listening. Go ahead. Um, I'm I get a little confused sometimes when I'm going through like the chapters in the navigate of the book. Cause like it'll have like uh it's go. supposed to be chapter 10, exactly but then it's then it has like chapter 11 flashcards. And so I'm a little bit confused now, on that. So, so here's what's weird. So we bought our book from them. We bought everything from Navigate. When you buy your book, it comes from them. But when they label things, they didn't go by what the book they gave out. I don't know why that is done that way. I have no idea. But if you will... I have not gone in there and changed that because it takes a very long time to change each individual one. If you have confusions or you have trouble, uh, you just get that vapor lock, just message me. If I'm around my computer, I can give you those answers. Um, I get it. I know that I, I should have taken the time, but life happens and I don't have a whole lot of time. I don't have a lot of free time. But go I just don't want to like what, do the wrong flashcards for that chapter that we're on is what I was worried about. So everything underneath your initial heading. So if you click on chapter for tonight, everything underneath there is the correct. This may have the wrong number, but go with the number that is on the chapter. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. And 
I need to get better and fix those issues that I know that they're there. How about that? Is that better? <laughs> so it was it was okay. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm not blaming anybody or nothing like that. I just wanted to be sure I was doing the right information for that chapter. You hundred percent are, and I appreciate you bringing that up because I know that there are some other ones. Uh, no, Colby, here's your class code. I'm sorry. Let me. I'll get back to you in a second. Class code tonight is capital P T V seven eight eight. That's your class code. Um, I didn't have it in the slide tonight. I, I apologize. But yes, anytime you look at Navigate, and if you open up chapter 47, I'm just using that number, but it's got slides from 46 go off of the chapter that's at the very top. That is correct. I made sure, and I actually, thanks to Rebecca, I entered the wrong test the other day. She took the test, and it was the wrong test. Um, so I corrected my mistake, 100% my fault, no issues there. I got it all reset. But uh, Rebecca, yes, I'm looking at your message and I'm pretty sure I e responded to your email, but I will type you out a message here in just a minute. Does anybody have any questions, other issues or anything like that? All right, well, I'm gonna let that be a, a ending for the night. I'm gonna go get something to eat. I'm hungry, I'm a fat kid, so it's time to eat. I hope hey, you so have a was wonderful there, evening. I'm yes, sorry to interrupt. Was there a quiz from night before last? Cause you know, I had, had it messaged you about that and I couldn't find one that was yeah. opened up. So, on Tuesday, there is not one from Tuesday because if I understand right, y'all just had the guest speaker. Right. So that was on Rob. Rob knew that I was not, I was not in my. So if y'all can, don't worry about Tuesday. Just start with tonight's thing. Uh, if Rob didn't give you any type of attendance code, then don't worry about that. The I'm talking about the class prior to that. Uh, so if there is a class code, it is the one that was put in the chat just a minute ago. That is the zero money sign X. T Y quiz man not, not class code quiz oh. for the chapter quiz for when we did BLS and all that stuff. Yes, let me um hold on a second. Let me end this and I can go. I need to get into navigate some form of fashion here and I can answer that pretty quick. I didn't have navigate up, so I apologize. Didn't have that on you. Because when I went in and looked, there was nothing that was that we were able to open or that I was able to find. And I had messaged you about it, and I know yes, you said that you I, were that was traveling, or either I, I I probably got overwhelmed with because I've had a lot lot of questions here lately so i do apologize that i did not answer your question um no that's fine i just want to make sure that i don't that if there is something that i don't end up not getting credit for so bls there is it's a chapter 13 quiz um i will go in there and open that right now and i will give you a a, a, a uh let me use your override and if you will tell me your last name again Veil. All right, because I remember 100% remember your your message coming through. So that is that's 100% my fault. All right, so I gave you until tomorrow night to complete that. How about that? Okay, it'll get done tonight. Yep, not a problem. And you don't have a password. Some I've given some of y'all passwords, some of you not passwords. Um, so you don't have to worry about that. You are open. Um, I'm going to leave my computer up and everything. If there's an issue, uh, just shoot me a message and I'll come back right, in, right back in here and I'll fix it. Okay, thanks. Yeah, uh, okay, Caesar, you're good. So, but yeah, I'll take care of you if you need something back. I'll leave my computer up. All right, folks. Again, thank you for everything. Thank you, Joseph, for bringing that to my attention. I am human. I do make a lot of errors. And don't tell my wife that. But we'll, uh, I'm going to take care of you guys, I promise.
And if y'all also look at Navigate, I will be transferring your grades over to this new, the new module. So don't think that you don't have any grades. I'm slowly transferring those over. All right, folks, I hope you all have a good evening. I'm gonna shut up and leave you alone now. Uh, if you have any issues, please call me or please send me a message. Good night. <laughs>